What if we were to reconsider what normal looks like when we talk about mental health? An illness like schizophrenia is misunderstood and stigmatized. But what is life like for those living with it? Susan Doherty explores that in her new book, The Ghost Garden, Inside the Lives of Schizophrenia's Feared and Forgotten. And she joins us now for more. Welcome. Thank you, Nam. Thank you it's for having me. It's really nice to meet you. Um, this book was fantastic. It's really difficult to read at times. Um, and I want to talk to you about what it was like for you to write it. But uh, it's a fantastic book. Oh, thank you so much. Um, your previous book was the 2015 novel, uh, A Secret Music. Yes. Um, what did your fiction writing contribute to this project, The Ghost Garden? Well, both of them required me to do a lot of research. Um, in, with The Secret Music, I was specifically looking at treatment options for mental illness in the 1930s. Um, one of the main characters in the book suffered from depression. And that word hadn't even been coined back in the 1930s. So I went really? to the, I know it hadn't. So I called it flattened anxiety in the book. Anyway, I went to the Douglas Hospital, went to the library and the archive. And the Douglas Hospital is Do a psychiatric hospital. A psychiatric hospital affiliated with McGill University. In Montreal, right? In Montreal. It used to be called the Protestant Asylum for the Insane. Mm. And um, yes, I did research for a secret music in the library in the archive department. And the transparency was, was they gave me everything that I needed for the book. But I called them a few weeks later and I said, uh, how can I help? I'd like to be a volunteer. Um, it, I find that really fascinating. So you went from researching for a book. Yes. And then putting your hand up and saying, I want to volunteer. Right. Um, what, what, what did you want to do? Why do that? You could have just walked away. I could have just walked away. But, you know, one of the issues in A Secret Music was I, w I was trying to understand how trauma in childhood affects us as adults. That was one of the themes in A Secret Music. And so when I was on the grounds of the hospital and, and uh, there were patients that were actually working in the library and I thought, this must be a really special place that, you know, we all need to live with purpose. And the fact that they were, you know, people that lived at the hospital were working in the library. So I, yes, I, I wanted to volunteer there. Do you know on the volunteer front, People rush to volunteer on cancer wards mm. and pediatric wards, but the, the psych wards? Why do you think that is? I think it's the fear factor. People are afraid of this, the delusional part of schizophrenia, the psychotic symptoms. Um, once, when they see behavior that is you know, not considered normal, um, they don't understand it, and, and, they, and they pull away. And it's so isolating for the people who have psychosis. Well, um, this book, um, The Ghost Garden, is centered around a woman called Caroline, who you knew from childhood. Yes. What were the first signs of her mental illness? You know, she started to, to really change in grade 11, in her senior year of high school. And, of course, we didn't know anything, anything back then. But I guess the first few things that happened is she had a huge uh, group of friends in grade 10. A big family, too. Big family. She's one Nine of 10 kids. children, oh, ten. one of 10 children. Mm -hmm. And she had lots of friends. She was on the basketball team, the student council. And then in grade 11, she stopped being interested in, in all of her activities. Her grades dropped. She stayed in her room. So those are, that's what's called the prodromal phase of mental illness. Mm -hmm. Just those behaviors, that's the tipping point. And I think for a lot of people, um, and I think maybe this was one of the challenges for her family, is that that could just be written off oh, as, oh, absolutely. You're, she's a teenager, she's, a teenager. she's being moody. Or, exactly. You know, exactly. How do you know if it's something worse or something more, something that needs to be addressed? But you know, the next thing that happened for Caroline was she would make these outrageous statements. And, um, you know, Starsky and Hutch were, were in her rooms at the Banff Springs Hotel, or she had ideation about boys uh, who were in love with her, and, and none of that was true. And we all chalked it up to her trying to make her life bigger or that she was liar, liar, pants on fire, when in actual fact, she was beginning to break down. So that's, that's my first message to all of us, um, to parents, to siblings, to when you see a person change in front of your eyes, your radar should go up. Mm. And it would be uh, at least a decade or until she was diagnosed with anything, um, right? Oh, yeah. Well, it was, it was actually Longer. almost two decades. I mean, she had had um, 
long stays on the Four East at the uh, Lakeshore General in Montreal. Three long stay, six month. But she was never really diagnosed with anything. You know, in the beginning, they thought it was depression. They uh -huh. thought it was postpartum. She's a mom. She has two sons. They thought it was anxiety. They, they thought it was, I mean, she, bipolarity. Mm -hmm. and, and for all of those diagnoses, she was given medication. So... Um, Do you think it could have helped her had she been diagnosed sooner with schizophrenia? Do you know what's so curious? She had her first, her very, very first psychiatric appointment. Um, the doctor said to, to Caroline, you know, you're just a flower child. You're going to find your way. And, and maybe she would have. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, there's so much that we don't understand about schizophrenia and how, how, it, how it starts or where in the brain it starts. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sure with her family too, there was, there's probably a lot of could have, should have oh my that gosh. go through your mind. Yes, you know? yes. Um, you were talking about some of the claims that she was making when she was uh, in high school. Right. But um, eventually, her uh, her mental health declines to a point where she actually accuses her brother and father of sexually assaulting her. How did you react uh, when you learned about this part of Caroline's history? Well, I mean, I was a very good friend of Caroline's older sister, Rosalind, and so I was around the house a lot. So. I immediately knew that it, it was it was false, and I asked you know Rosalind um, how she felt, and and she was sickened uh, that Ros that Caroline had thoughts like that. I mean it, it was it was um, a really devastating thing to find those papers in a box under the bunk bed, mm -hmm. but you know as Rosalind says, they were there were ten children, two dogs, two cats in a medium sized house. She said there there would there would be no place for that to happen, and so. And, and the boxes that you refer to is that Caroline... Caroline years, wrote down all these, these accusations right. against her father and her brother. Um, yes, and that, that was another critical moment for the family, recognizing that uh, Caroline's set point was very different from uh, everyone else. You mentioned one of the sisters, Rosalind, and th these are not their real names, um, and another sister, Peggy. Yeah. And they become <clears throat> the core of the family support throughout Caroline's battles with schizophrenia. Can you tell yes. us more about them? You know, Rosalind and Peggy, uh, well, first of all, tw about 20 years ago, Rosalind started to document Caroline's path. Um, she'd had uh, psychotic breakdown after psychotic breakdown, and, and she really... Um, needed to document everything. And uh, both Peggy and Rosalind live in Ottawa, which is where Caroline lives. And so geographically, it was very easy for them to, to shoulder the burden. And um, both of those two sisters have made it their mission to look after their sister. I thought it was so incredible uh, how much love they had uh, because uh, some members of her family um, might not have been present for whatever reasons. Um, but how much ongoing support did Caroline receive from her mother, Isabel? You know, in the early days, um, Isabel knew that, uh, that Caroline was the most sensitive of her 10 children. And when she was a little girl, Isabel was, was completely there for her. And I think what happened with Isabel is, is she, she burned out. I mean, the, the verbal abuse, one of the symptoms of a, of a psychotic episode, over time, it, it just wore Isabel down mm -hmm. and, um, and she, she really pulled away and, and left the caregiving of Caroline to, to her daughters, principally Rosalind and Peggy, because they lived in Ottawa. Yeah, she burned out. And this really hurt Caroline. Do you know, it, it did because they'd been so close when they were, when Caroline was younger. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one of the things I want to say is we can't judge Isabel. The, the hardship on the family to look after uh, a really mentally ill, symptomatic son or daughter, it, it's incalculable, the, the, the weight, mm -hmm. the burden for family members. Well, one of the sisters at one point relates that uh, it feels like as if they have PTSD. Right. Um, how does an illness like schizophrenia uh, impact a family? Well, I mean, the ones that are in there for the long haul, it's um, it's a burden unless you reach out and get help yourself. And but that's also if you know where to <coughs> exactly. reach out. Exactly, and right? we we need more services. I mean, one of the things that Rosalind said to me when we were um, doing the book together was she said nobody ever phoned her or said, Rosalind, how are you doing? Um, you know, we do need more family services 
to to look after the family members because it you're right mm -hmm. it is an incredible stress on the family you mentioned that caroline um did have children she had two kids yes, she had two boys she was also married um were those connections a help or did they cause more harm to her mental health that's a really good question i would say it was a blessing and a curse it was um, a curse in that she felt terrible guilt that she wasn't able to mother her children the way she would have wanted to had she not had the symptoms of schizophrenia. And the blessing is she was um, on hospital units for long stay, I mean, year after year after year, and she always had something to look forward to. And as Ralston said to me, it kept her from committing suicide, mm. that she had those two boys always at the end of the tunnel. And the impact of the kids? Do you know, it's hard to say. She's really shielded them mm -hmm. from everything. I mean, she she has not shared with her boys um, all of the hardest moments of her life. I mean, the, the Evergreen story where she had her first psychiatric, uh, her psych psychotic breakdown. Um, she worries terribly that, that what happened to her might happen to them, like mm -hmm. the genetic component. Um, but they're two, they're lovely, lovely boys. They really are. Something that I found really interesting reading this book is that there's actually uh, a connection with cigarettes. Oh, yes. Um, and mental illness, or is it just schizophrenia? So, so what a, a huge per percentage of people with schizophrenia smoke cigarettes. And the reason is antipsychotic medications target the dopamine system in the brain, and the dopamine system is our reward system. And, um, you know, even drinking a glass of water activates your dopamine system. But things like eating chocolate or um, sex, I mean, exercise, there are a multitude of ways to excite the dopamine pathways. And so for a, pers for a person who's taking antipsychotic medication, the dopamine is reduced. Mm -hmm. So smoking cigarettes, it targets, when you smoke a cigarette, the nicotine hits the nicotine receptors in the brain, and the nicotine receptors release dopamine. So in, a, in effect, it's a survival mechanism. But then I guess that's also creating additional health uh, challenges. Oh, yes, the lungs, the cardiovascular problems. And hospitals used to dole them out every hour just as part of you know, the daily routine on the unit. Um, the Royal Ottawa in Ottawa, long ago, they said, okay, we are, we are adding to the health concerns for the patient, and they've made a concerted effort to, to help people with schizophrenia cut down on smoking. Um, I want to read something from your book. Thank you. And one of the serious symptoms of schizophrenia that you discuss in the book is that of hearing voices. Mm -hmm. uh, you write, MRIs have shown that the same areas of the brain light up when a person hears an actual voice and when a person has an auditory hallucination. This explains why so many people who hear such command voices insist that the CIA or some other secret agency has implanted a bug in their brains. It's a possible way to comprehend the experience, especially when no one else hears what is so clearly articulated to them. We all hear voices in order to process our experiences. We lie in bed on a sleepless night and hear a steady stream of chatter that does not stop. We think our way through our problems with silent, insistent, and often miserable internal conversations. So what is the difference, what is the differences between the voices that you and I might hear uh, during a stressful night um, and the voices that Caroline experienced? Well, to your mo what you said a moment ago about the MRIs, like when they have done neuroimaging of the brain of a person who is hearing a voice, that a, 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 an external person who is speaking to them, and then a person who is hearing voices, there's the same brain activity. And to, your, also, to another point that you brought up is that that hearing voice experience is so real that I can't tell you how many people have said to me that the FBI or the CIA has planted a device in their brain because for them, the hearing voice experience is so real, it's the only plausible explanation. Mm. It, it's so they feel like they're actually they in do danger. well they, they and you know sometimes the voices are are caring and caressing mm. but most of the time they are persecutory and they are evil and they undermine the person and you know the negative negative voices um, at one point you write mm. about how Caroline's voices are telling her to hurt her roommate who you call uh, Hillary uh, what happened so Caroline and Hillary met on a psychiatric unit 
and they were both long stay patients, and they became friends on the on the unit, which is they became actually, really good friends. Became yeah. really, I mean, it's very rare. Mm -hmm. It's you know, even in my own experience, for the last ten years, I, I have not seen that best friend thing happening on the unit, and so they made plans to to live together. Their release dates were quite close together. And even the nurses and the social workers on the unit sanctioned them living together. I, and so they, you know, uh, Hillary had her own townhouse and she invited Caroline to be to be her roommate. And then there's a third roommate, and Simon. And there was a third right Simon, who was a friend of Caroline's. But almost immediately, neither of them had um, been off the unit for very long. Well, if the toilet plugged or um, what day is recycling, paying the bills, everything became too overwhelming for Caroline. And uh, within a couple of months, she started hearing voices and she started, um, a voice told her that the devil was living inside Hillary's body. So what happened was she filled a kettle with boiling, she filled a kettle with water on the stove and she, once it came to a boil, she walked over to the couch where Hillary was sleeping and she poured boiling water in Hillary's ear because she was told that's where the devil was breathing. Hillary survived? Hillary survived. Um, third degree burns on her neck, back, arms, her chest. She does have some permanent hearing loss. And um, Has Caroline come to terms with what she did or? Do you know, I, in the exploration of this book, the boiling water incident is the only thing that she has not been able to crawl back into and discuss. Everything else, and there were, well, when you read the book, there are so many trip-ups, mm -hmm. so many psychotic, delusional moments. She took an airplane to Newfoundland one time to meet a fictional person. But um, the fact that she hurt her friend, um, she has not yet been able to reconcile that. What medications were prescribed to help Caroline deal with her schizophrenia? Well, I guess she started with the first generation antipsychotics that she was taking Haldol. Um, she was obviously on sleeping pills. She was taking benzodiazepines for anxiety. And then um, in the 1990s, when second generation antipsychotics came onto the market, she was uh, switched to Zyprexa, which is uh, olanzapine is the generic name here in Canada. And unfortunately, um, she developed diabetes, which is a side effect of, um, of olanzapine. Mm. And um, she's quite debilitated now by, by that side effect of diabetes. She also had electroconvulsive shock yes. therapy, right? Yes, she had ECT. And um, do you know that ECT is making a little bit of a quiet comeback uh, for some patients Mm -hmm. um, they experience a huge lift out of a major depression. Um, you know, scientists do not understand how or why ECT works, um, but for some, it is it is a viable treatment option. Uh, you quote Caroline as saying, uh, "Society needs to wait for people to heal instead of throwing meds at us. We are all fragile." Um, how well would you say that drugs worked for Caroline? Well. The drugs are speculative, and the reason the drugs are speculative is because we don't know where on the brain, which, which receptors, which parts of the prefrontal cortex, where on the cerebrum we can locate schizophrenia, the, the origins. And so it makes all drugs um, speculative. Um, you know, I give the example of, you know, John, John Kennedy Jr. Uh, flying his plane without the horizon Sometimes we land on Martha's Vineyard and sometimes we crash into the ocean. They are speculative and so a lot of people do not benefit from drugs and some people do, but it is very much trial and error. Uh, near the end of the ghost garden, there's this passage and you write, as I wrote this book, I flip-flopped between embracing the necessity of antipsychotic medication and vilifying the culture that has made sedation a major aspect of treatment. There is still no evidence that medication corrects a biological abnormality. The notion that biochemical imbalance in the brain is the root cause of mental illness is still speculative. Extreme mental illness is, however, a debilitating series of experiences that cannot be wished away. 
Um, if medication isn't the answer, is there a solution that helps both the person who's living with schizophrenia and the person they might harm um, if their symptoms lose control? Well, that's a good question. I mean, to, to the first question, I mean, the humanity of a person is often disguised by their symptoms, and we, we don't see the human being. We only see um, the delusions and the paranoia and... And so that's really interesting. So you're saying that um, the medication is a way, kind of, to just shut that person up, or it, to yeah, make does. the problem the, go away. The, the sedative aspects of antipsychotics it, it quietens them down and it makes them more acceptable to their family. It makes them more acceptable to society, but it doesn't necessarily benefit uh, the patient or or the person because you know the side effects are lethargy and brain fog, uh, obesity constipation, dry mouth, erectile dysfunction. I mean, the side effects are really profound, added to the burden of having the symptoms of mental illness. So yes, I really did flip-flop between the medication model, which is all pervasive, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the human connection, which is, in my opinion, the infinity angle. You know, it's free, it doesn't come with side effects. Um, you know, it, it, it addresses things But like, it's hard, right? It is hard. It is hard. I mean, I, I, ad, I advocate for non-medical specialists. I mean, I've been a volunteer for 10 years, and volunteers can, can carry the weight for the family members and for social workers um, because we can be the fairy godmother and, and come in and spend a couple of hours every few days or once a week. And, and, we, and we haven't burned out, and we can... And you can also just leave, right? Yes, you can detach. exactly. Where exactly. sometimes families the might family, not feel like they yes, can. Yes, yes. You know, the, over the years, the willingness of families to sacrifice everything for their children is something I've witnessed time and time again. And then there are family members that, that walk away, and I don't judge anybody from walking away. And I... I want to go back to this uh, point about the humanity because um, <clears throat> within the book about Caroline, you have different stories from some of the people yes. that you've met um, while volunteering. One of the people that you write about is a person called Norman, um, and he lives in a group home, and he suffered from what you call a lack of purpose. Uh, how did you help him find a purpose? So Norman suffers from agoraphobia, from an incident that happened to him when he was a teenager, and he had a hard time leaving the house, had a hard time, you know, the, the only, he would venture out to buy cigarettes at the Dépanneur, which is the little corner store. And a lovely, lovely man who eventually told me his whole life story, and he was a scientist, he wanted to be a teacher, and so I suggested that we go to the library together, and that I would be with him, and that if he felt overwhelmed, we could leave. So um, he also doesn't look um, disheveled, he's slim, he hasn't been overly um, affected by the side effects of the medication. So I proposed to him that he take a course to be a peer support worker. And he was very reluctant. He, it took him a long time to come around to the idea of being mm -hmm. a peer support worker. But it's changed his life because, um, you know, peer support is that a person has walked the walk talked the talk, been stigmatized, been shunned by their families. And so it's a beautiful experience when a peer support worker can speak to somebody who's just emerging with a mental illness. And that's the purpose. Like, I really thought that was so important because I think all of us, as we move through life, we want to get married or not, oh, yes. or have children, travel. But then when we think of people who are, have mental illness, um, that desire to have a purpose doesn't go away. Well, and you know, it's our, our society, we're so bent on achievement. And, you know, are, are we more of a human being if we contribute to society? Like, does everybody get to call themselves a human being? You know, when, when, we, when we look at achievement as beauty and homes and marriages and babies and, and all of the set points, the benchmarks mm -hmm. that we consider success, then people with, with mental illness that then are moved off the grid. So I try very hard to help them find ways to feel purposeful. And it's not going to be what they had set out to do. When they were in high school, they, they had dreams to do a PhD. They had dreams and, you know, the illness robs them of their earlier dreams. But their life still matters. Their life still matters and the ones that can move mm -hmm. into accepting the symptoms and finding 
find a new way to have purpose, those, that's the recovery of mental illness. Uh, you also tell the story of Andrew who is unmedicated, right. but who's, what you write, clean lifestyle will help him live longer than other schizophrenics. Um, how big an impact on life expectancy does schizophrenia typically have? Uh, it's about 20 years less than the average person, and it's a combination of, well, lack of motivation is one of the side effects of having schizophrenia, so they tend not to exercise. Um, the medication makes them lethargic, it causes obesity, lung problems, they all smoke like chimneys. So the combination of all of those factors uh, lowers their life expectancy by 20 years. So um, We only have like a few seconds oh, left, but moving you. forward, how much time and energy are you going to be able to continue to devote to volunteering now that the book is finished? Oh, I work there every Tuesday. I'm yeah. at the Douglas. I love being on CPC3, which is psychotic disorders. Does it impact you at all, like you and your family? Because you're dealing with people who people want to forget and who are going through a really hard time. Do you know, I have been as profoundly affected my, by my friendships as they have been. It's, um, it's my purpose in my life, too. No, I, I love every minute of what I do. I really do. And you'll continue to volunteer. I will, yeah. I will. Well, thank you so much for writing this book. Um, it's a fantastic book, and I think um, there's so much that we can give to other people without them having to ask. Um, we can be um, more kind to, um, to, I guess, to each other, because yes. you never know. <clears throat> Yes. Anyone can, this can happen to anybody. Yes, it can, it can. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, I loved our interview. Thank you, Nam. Thank, Thank you. you. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario and by viewers like you. Thank you.